good evening, everyone. So thank you for joining us this evening at our Archives Unlocked online series. So we're happy to have with us today, Ms. Jessica Yeo, who is an audiovisual archivist at the National Archives of Singapore. So she has helped in the curation of NAS's online access initiatives, Sounds of Yesteryear, 1903 to 1941, featuring pre-war sound records, preserving memories, 50 moments in time, showcasing audiovisual recordings from 1968 to 2017, as well as blasts from the past, which recounts Singaporeans' shared experiences through archival records. So I will now pass the time on to Jessica. Thank you. This talk was originally supposed to be held in June, but for obvious reasons, it was postponed and now it's online. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing special about today's date. Actually, the 27th of October is the UNESCO World Day for Audiovisual Heritage. So it's the perfect day today to be introducing ourselves to the audiovisual heritage of Singapore from the 60s, 70s and the 80s. Now um, before I start, you might be wondering why the title is Rediscovering Singapore. Well, um, I wasn't able to experience most or all of these decades while growing up. So for me, looking through our collections for materials to share tonight was also an opportunity for me to discover stuff that I've only ever um, heard or read about in the past. So um, this talk is meant to be a sampler of the interesting recordings that we have from these decades. And I hope it's a good sample for you and that it will encourage you to explore the rest of our collections. Okay, let's start with the National Archives of Singapore. We were established in 1968 and since 2012, we have been a part of the National Library Board. So um, this is a photo of how our building looks like currently. Unfortunately, we can't um, be sitting there today, but I hope that you'll join us for our future talks that will be held at the building. We are responsible for the collection, preservation and management of Singapore's public and private archival records. Um, we are the official custodian of Singapore's collective memory as seen through documents such as government files, historical maps and photographs oral history interviews, and of course, audiovisual records. As for the audiovisual archives, which I come from, um, we were established in 1995, so we are fairly young. And we started with an initial collection size of 8,000 videotapes and film reels. Today, we have over 300,000 records, and we are the most comprehensive public resource for audiovisual materials in Singapore. Our objective has always been to collect preserve and provide access to audiovisual records of national or historical significance created by public officers, private organizations such as broadcasting stations and private individuals. So our collections today include um, government productions, radio and TV programs from Mediacorp and its predecessors, commercial sound recordings, and home movies donated by past and present residents of Singapore. So, as you can see, we don't just keep government stuff, we have recordings of very normal people too. Normal people like these two kids who are featured in our oldest home movie from the 1930s. And other normal people like this person who is actually me. <laughs> yes, you can find lots of weird and wonderful things in the archives. Okay, so now you may be thinking, I didn't know the archives has so many audiovisual recordings. Where can I view them? The short answer is on our archives online website. However, we do have four tiers of access, depending on where you are accessing the website from. Um, we have a selection of recordings available for streaming online here um, on archives online, such as the Barita Singapore series, which I will be introducing shortly. But if you visit the website on the multimedia stations in the public libraries, you will be able to stream more content such as current affairs programs like Tuesday Report and Code Red. And if you visit the website on the multimedia stations in the Lee Kong Chen um, reference library, which is on the 11th floor of the National Library building on Victoria Street, you will also be able to stream content such as older news bulletins like News 5 Tonight. But our full collection of digitized recordings is accessible from the multimedia stations in our archives reading room, which is located just inside the entrance of the National Archives building. So do visit us sometime soon. Okay, this is a screenshot of um, the audiovisual and sound recordings page on Archives Online. Um, if you want to visit it, um, there's a QR code and a URL so you can get there directly. 
Um, as for how to search for recordings, there are several methods. One would be the advanced search function here. So if you click on it, you see several fields that you can use to conduct your search. I have highlighted four here. Source, collection, program title, and accession number. Um, the, accession, the accession number is a unique 10 digit number given to each recording. So as I introduce different collections and recordings later, you'll see that I have indicated um, what search terms you can use to find the same or similar recordings. Another method of searching for recordings is by exploring the different genres available here. So if you click on show all genres, you will get the full list of 20 genres that you can browse. For example, if you're looking for News 5 tonight, you can find them under News Bulletins. And if you're looking for Talking Point, you can look under Current Affairs. Uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, Talking Point is a current affairs program. So even if it's an episode from 1994, it is still classified as a current affairs program, uh, even though the topics discussed are not very current anymore. Okay, so you've either entered your search terms or click on whichever genre you're interested in. Now you'll get the search results page. If you click on any of the recordings here, you will get to the individual record details page. Um, if you're conducting the search from your own mobile device or desktop, you'll see one of the following things. If you see a media player like this, and um, it means that the full recording can be streamed online. If you see the media player like this, but it says short clip and there's a message below, um, it means the full recording can only be accessed from the location indicator in the message. So in this case, um, at the National Archives and the Lee Kong Chen Reference Library. And in many cases, there won't be a media player, but you'll see one of these messages. So you just follow it to the correct location and you can view the recording on the multimedia stations there. Um, this is an example of the library multimedia stations. Uh, you'll find them in the public libraries and the national library. And when you click on the radio and TV archives and more button here, you will get a selection of series or curated content that are available for viewing. But on to the meat of this talk. Uh, we start in the 1960s. We all know this decade. Um, huge changes in Singapore. We started the decade having just gained um, internal self-government and a few years later we joined Malaysia and in by the middle of the decade we had become an independent country. So during this period um, many homes and schools and factories were being built to house, educate and provide job opportunities for Singapore's young and growing population. Landscapes were changing, public services were being rolled out and all these developments were actually being captured on film at that time. The People's Singapore and Burrito Singapura series were news magazine films produced by the Ministry of Culture um, in the 1960s. So it was a sort of overview on the social economic um, developments and life in 1960s Singapore. The films were produced in the four official languages and Chinese dialects. Um, here's a short video on what you can expect to see in these recordings. Receiving sets too have been unpacked in their hundreds, tested and sent out to the shops. One of the big changes in Singapore in the past year has been the growth and improvement of community centres. There are now nearly 50 of them in many different parts of the island. Town after town, all over the island. Mountbatten, Kallang, McPherson, St Michael's, Tiong Bahru, Bukit Ho Swe. The new town school is integrated and co-educational. Teaching is in English and Chinese. However, pupils learn Malay, the national language too. As the state industrializes and develops, more and more goods are being made locally, giving more employment all round and better value for everyone.
The mobile library visits community centres in seven different parts of the Republic. By the end of the year, the service should reach another six centres, most of them in districts well away from the town. The Bukit Ho Sui disaster was a terrible shock to Singapore. The worst fire since the war and one of the worst in our history. Udan Ti Huang Ying Su Liao Ao, Da Jin Zai Pok Su, Hien Hu Ni, Kwa Tu Sing Ka Po Ki, Gap Dian Hap Go Ki Ta, Ji Ba Yi Zhe La Ge Hui Wan Go Yi Go Ki, Dang Zui Piao Yong. Sing Ka Po Ki Yi Go Liap Chi, Dai Biao Min Zhu, Ho Bing, Jin Bo, Gong Jing, Bing Ding. Hot favourite for the last event of the meeting, the Grand Prix for motor cars, was international Australian driver Greg Cusack in his truly beautiful Brabham Ford, by far the most powerful car in the race. To make it more attractive to visitors and local residents, Raffles Place has been transformed into a colourful roof garden over an underground car park. Are you one of those clever drivers who goes too fast and breaks the law, except when there's a traffic cop in sight? Well, thanks to radar, you're going to get caught in future. In Singapore, all men are brothers. We are a people of many communities. And the happiness and well-being of each one of us depends upon our ability to be tolerant of each other, of our different habits of life and of religion. Okay, so lots and lots of interesting footage, as you can see. But personally, for me, my favourite Burrito Singapore films are actually those about life on Singapore's offshore islands. If you didn't grow up during that period, it's strange to think that these islands used to be inhabited by thousands of people back then. Well, um, take this following film, for example. Let's just say it features a famous island that people don't get to visit these days as tourists. This is Pulau Tekong, the biggest of Singapore's many offshore islands, an area covering 4,429 acres. And now we're in a simple fishing village. The street and the buildings look like any other fishing village. So is the market, where the islanders buy fish, vegetables, fruits and other daily necessities. This particular shop sells bricks, brought over from Changi Point, no doubt. Unfortunately, the island has very poor amenities. Modern sanitation has not reached the villages as yet. Yes, this shop has a refrigerator, no doubt, but one swallow doesn't make a summer. The refrigerator and the gas lamp are perhaps the only touch of modern living that has reached the village, apart from a few privately operated generators to produce electricity. Running water has yet to come to the villages, and the only available water for drinking and washing is obtained from wells. Apart from some mud tracks, roads as such do not exist. But large tracts of undeveloped or underdeveloped land can be made available for more fruitful farming to meet Singapore's own needs. So, in 1957, there were actually 4,000 people living on Pulau Tekong. And although they faced lots of hardships, as you can see in that film, some of these films always made the island life look so idyllic. Well, Moving on to the primary production department. In 1964, just as it was, uh, just as it is today, there was little suitable land for farming in Singapore. However, back then, Singapore actually produced enough pigs and poultry for local needs, and they even had enough to uh, export to Malaysia. So, in fact, the total value of produce from farms during that period was almost $200 million. In other words, agriculture was quite a big thing back then. And during this period, the primary production department was in charge of serving the needs of farmers and fishermen. 
their focus in the 60s and the 70s was to improve production by introducing new methods of farming and fishing. And in the course of this work, they captured a lot of footage, such as livestock and fish farms, rural Singapore, plant cultivation of crops and of flowers, especially orchids, and of the greening of Singapore. Because back then, Singapore was striving to be a garden city. So there was a lot of footage of trees being planted by the roadside and of tree planting day. So just to note though, that almost all the films in this collection are rushes or silent raw footage like this one over here. Um, however, if you're doing research into Singapore's agricultural past, you'll find that the primary production department's films are a very rich visual source for your research. Over the years, the HDB has actually produced or rather commissioned several documentaries on the rehousing of Singapore's population. Um, these documentaries not only capture the excitement of people moving into their new high-rise apartments, but also the changing landscapes in Singapore from the 1960s onwards, as people were gradually moved from kampongs to HDB flats. And many of these documentaries also give insights into the town planning process back then. Here we have part one of Happy Homes. This documentary is a bit unusual because the film is in colour and also the visuals are very sharp. So just sit back and enjoy these scenes of Singapore in the 1960s. Singapore, one of the loveliest and most varied of all tropical cities. Resting almost on the equator, its architectural styles derive from all quarters of the earth, as is natural to one of the world's oldest crossroads. Sleek modern buildings provide the city's atmosphere of solid prosperity and metropolitan dignity. But Singapore is an Asian city whose colourful immigrants have brought with them their oriental cultures and traditions, creating a new state, rich in picturesque contrasts. Singapore has one of the highest birth rates in the world, with a soaring population whose sheer numbers create slums from graceful arcaded streets. Over the years, the overflow from the tenements have put up shacks on any bit of vacant land until too many parts began to look like this. So some parts of this film actually look like they could have been filmed just yesterday, right? Anyway, moving on. If you are interested um, in more scenes of Singapore in the 1960s, one good resource is our collection of family films. These are personal films captured by people who were living in Singapore during that time. As you might imagine, not a lot of people could afford their own film camera back then. So the majority of these films were shot by expatriates who later donated the recordings to the National Archives. Many of them actually mentioned that they set out to capture memories of Singapore before they returned home. But especially because they could see that the landscape was already changing so rapidly and a lot of these sites would disappear in the next few years. Here we have a clip from one of these donated films. It's not very clear, but some of you may recognize the landmark inside. Okay. Uh, it was quite brief, but that was the Sea View Hotel, which used to be located on the seafront in Katong. It opened in 1906 and closed in 1964. So when this footage was captured around, the, around 1960, it was already way past its prime. But during the 1930s, um, the Sea View Hotel is actually one of the most iconic hotels in Singapore, in the same league as the Raffles Hotel. Because of its countryside location, it earned a reputation as a place where people could go to recuperate during illnesses. So actually, I used to read about the Sea View Hotel in books, about how famous it was, and I used to think, oh, that's quite nice. But when I saw this footage and recognized the landmark, it hit me that, wow, it actually really existed. Now, moving on to the 1970s. Although television was introduced to Singapore in 1963, it will be more than a decade before the first programs were broadcast in colour. 
Hello. You can see me clearly now, but uh, not the room. This is because the light is on me, but there's hardly any around me. How do you see color? This is an important question because color television is based on the way our eyes work. When the lights were down a moment ago, you could hardly make out vaguely the shape and sizes of the tables and chairs and there was someone in the room, but not the colours. Okay, that may not have been the most exciting TV programme ever, but it's very significant. Because colour television was introduced in 1974, and Colour and You, this programme, was one of the earliest colour programmes on TV. So it, it explained the science behind colour television, and it showed viewers how to adjust the controls on the colour television sets. Well, um, fun fact. The very first test colour transmission occurred during the July 1974 World Cup final between West Germany and the Netherlands. As you might imagine, there, there was a huge rush to purchase colour television sets before the broadcast. But there were other milestones in the 1970s too, such as the introduction of the metric system. Now, I've always wondered why some of the older generation still talks about uh, measurements in terms of pounds and inches. And that's because before 1971, there was no standard system for weights and measures. So from 1971, programs like It's Happening in Singapore, Weights and Measures, um, was broadcast to help Singaporeans convert, pun intended, to using metric measurements like kilograms and meters. And in 1973, the old National Stadium was officially opened. There was a big parade in the stadium and the entire ceremony was broadcast live on TV. The 50,000-seat stadium was originally built not only to host major sporting events, um, the SIAP Games was the first, but it was hoped that by watching these sporting events, Singaporeans would be encouraged to take up sports too. So as you can see, there's a split between... Um, oops, I'm sorry. Wait, okay. As you can see, there's a split between the top half here, which are black and white programs, and the bottom half, which are colour programs. Yeah, so that occurred after the introduction of colour television. And finally, we have the Talent Time Grand Final of 1976, organised by the Radio and Television Singapore. Talent Times were all the rage in the 1960s and 70s. If you read the newspapers from the time, you see so many articles and advertisements about Talent Times that were being held by companies, by schools, by community centres. But the RTS competition was of course the most prestigious. It featured instrumental groups, vocal soloists, and vocal groups competing for the title. And yes, the final was broadcast live too. Now we have educational television programs. These were produced by the Curriculum Development Institute of Singapore and its predecessors between 1967 and 1983. These programs were originally meant as a teaching aid for secondary school students, but was eventually expanded to include programs targeted at primary school students and also pre-university students. The programs produced covered a wide variety of topics such as language instruction, science, mathematics, literature, civics, and home economics. Here's a very short look at an English lesson for secondary one students on Deepavali. Do you visit friends on Deepavali Day? Yes, I do. My brothers, sister and I go to the amusement park or to a show in the evening to enjoy ourselves. I'm sure you enjoy yourselves this Deepavali as well. Thank you for telling us all about Deepavali, Gopal. And thank you for inviting us. Right. Did you listen carefully to what Gopal said? Can you remember what was said? Here are some sentences. Please read them after me. All members of the family help in cleaning the house. Okay. We also have home movies from the 1970s. Compared to those from the 1960s, I would say that our 1970s home movies actually feature a lot more 
um, leisure activities that Singaporeans used to enjoy back then. For example, visiting local attractions such as the Singapore Zoo, the Botanic Gardens, as well as this place. Okay, um, this was not Big Splash, although it was known as the Big Splash of the western part of Singapore. It was actually Mitsukoshi Garden, which opened in 1979, which is the same year that this footage was recorded. So the novelty factor was still there, hence the huge crowds. Now we have reached the 1980s. The decade started with none other than the opening of Changi Airport. Nowadays, we are more concerned with what new is launching at the airport, but in 1981, the airport itself was the highlight of the day. Let's see some of its new features. A new era of civil aviation has arrived with the opening of Changi Airport, Singapore's newest gateway to the world. Changi Airport covers an area of over 1,600 hectares, five times that to the previous airport at Paya Labor. In terms of handling capacity, Changi is one of the largest airports in Asia. Its runway can handle 38 landings and takeoffs an hour. The passenger terminal building is designed to cope with 10 million passenger movements annually, including arrivals and departures. The central area is for passenger handling, while the two parallel finger piers are for aircraft to park right next to the building. With aero bridges, passengers step from the plane to the airport building, and travelators carry them smoothly to the processing counters. The arrival and departure halls are on separate floors to simplify passenger guidance. Well, it was obviously a big deal back then, but imagine getting so excited about travel letters and aero bridges today. Now, the Changi Takeoff was just one of many interesting programs and series from the 1980s. In 1982, the first episode of Mat Yo Yo was broadcast. It was a popular Malay language children's show, and it actually ran for 12 years on TV. In 2012, the series was revived and expanded with four versions in the four official languages. But you can still watch episodes from the original series at the archives. On 7 November 1987, another Singapore icon, the MRT system, was launched. The first ride captures all the fanfare and excitement during the MRT's first day in service. You see interviews with Singaporeans who were very impressed and excited and happy that they could now travel in air-conditioned comfort. And we take it for granted these days, but it was also mentioned how the launch would impact young children the most because they would be the first generation to grow up with the MRT. And last but not least, we have Diary of a Nation. It was an extensive documentary series produced in 1988 um, about milestones in Singapore's history. So you have topics such as the evolution of the Singapore bus service, the origins of the national flag and anthem, and the introduction of Singapore's own currency. Okay, moving on from 1986 onwards, we also have nightly news bulletins. Here's a clip from the earliest news bulletin in our collection from 1st July 1986. I wonder what was the hot topic back then? Dengue and dengue hemorrhagic fever are on the increase in Singapore. The Environment Ministry says 70 cases were reported during the past month. This compares with a monthly average of 10 during the first five months of the year. 
Ministry statements said the cases were confined to Taman Jurong, Jalan Sedap, Ang Mo Kyo, Jurong Road, Haokang, Geylang, Jalan Merah Saga and Pearls Hill Terrace. Measures have been taken to prevent the disease from spreading. The ministry has advised members of the public to seek medical attention if they suffer from fever, a skin rash, muscle and body aches and abdominal pain. Well, I guess some things don't change. Anyway, back then we only had recordings of English news. Today, we work with Mediacorp to record 14 news programs across TV and radio in the four official languages. And if you're wondering why I put that Raymond Will screenshot over there, it's because um, from my earliest memories of watching the nightly news, um, I, I always remember the Raymond Will advertisement. So it will forever be associated with um, the news to me. Okay, so... And finally, no overview of the 1980s would be complete without mentioning government campaigns. The Singapore Courtesy Campaign, the Speak Mandarin Campaign, the National Productivity Movement. These were just some of the iconic campaigns which were a mainstay on local media in the 1980s. We have many of these campaign commercials in the archives, immortalized by mascots such as Singa the Courtesy Lion and Timmy the Productivity Bee. Speaking of Timmy the Bee, you can sing along if you remember this song. Okay, so that's the end of the 1980s. And now for something completely different, or well, not completely different, but in case you were wondering if the archives has any material from before the 1960s, here are two bonus recordings for you with very interesting backstories. As mentioned earlier, television only arrived in Singapore in the 1960s. So um, footage of life in Singapore before that was quite rare and largely dependent on home movies. Here we have one of the earliest home movies in our collection. It was filmed by Robert Waddle between 1937 and 1942. Robert Waddle was an electrical engineer as well as an organist at St. Andrew's Cathedral. These two facts are important to his story. The film starts in 1937 with footage of his life in Singapore such as this clip. These were the sights one would see while dri driving down Orchard Road in 1937. If you look closely at the end, there's a policeman directing traffic. Well, because of his job as an electrical engineer, Robert Waddle got to visit some very cool places, such as the top of the Victoria Memorial Hall clock tower. Here's how the city hall area looked like in 1937. Okay, the most interesting part of this clip was the huge construction site. Yeah, here, um, beside the City Hall building. Yes, that was the former Supreme Court. Uh, at, it had just started construction that year. Okay, when Singapore was occupied in early 1942, Robert Waddle was not immediately interned with the other European residents. That was because the Japanese still needed um, his expertise to keep the public works running. 
So for the first nine months of the occupation, he was still able to move around the city and he secretly captured the following footage. Blink and you'll miss it, but at the right side of the film, you can see a Japanese soldier. And there's another one here. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously it was a very secret um, act <laughs> and he could have gotten into a lot of trouble for this. So yeah, this is very rare footage. Anyway, in late 1942, Robert Waddle found out that he would be interned in Changi prison shortly. So what he did was he went to St. Andrew's Cathedral and he hid his camera and his film in the organ pipes. So three years later, when the Japanese surrendered, he walked right back into the cathedral and the items were still there. And the film was eventually donated to the archives by his daughter. So that's how we can all enjoy it today. Speaking of the war, it disrupted many industries in Singapore, such as the recording industry, which um, it was not a well-known fact, but the recording industry in Singapore was actually booming back in the pre-war period. Here we have what is called a test pressing, which was sent to record companies so they could listen and select which um, recordings they would want to release commercially in the end. Except that this particular record was never released because if you look closely, it is dated October 8, 1941. And as we all know, the Japanese invaded not long after. In fact, this song, Punjak Dunia, which is translated as top of the world, actually talks about how nice it would be if you were on top of the world and far away from worldly disturbances. So it does make you wonder if it was actually referring to the war. Here's a short extract from the song. Okay, so well, if you're interested in what you have seen so far and uh, also interested in more recordings, my colleagues and I have been working really hard to bring more curated content to Archives Online. For example, Preserving Memories 50 Moments in Time, which we launched to commemorate the Archives 50th anniversary in 2018. We assembled 50 recordings, each representing a year since the establishment of the Archives in 1968. We also have Sounds of Yesteryear, 1903 to 1941, which features 52 pre-war sound recordings, including Punjak Dunya, which you just heard, and also the oldest recordings in our collection, which were both recorded here in Singapore in 1903. Uh, a question that uh, we usually get asked is um, about the sound quality of these recordings. Um, I think you need to understand that these recordings were commercial releases, so people actually bought them not for display at home, but to play at home quite regularly, I suppose. So there's going to be natural wear and tear. And um, usually the sound quality suffers because of that. And Punjab Dunya is an exception because it wasn't released. Finally, there's a sneak peek at our latest curated series, Old School TV, which we'll be launching in November. Over the next few months, we will be gradually releasing educational television programs on Archives Online, so stay tuned. And we have also had the privilege of working together with Mediacorp to make some of our curated content available on MeWatch under the Stories of Singapore section. We started with Stories of Yesteryear, Singapore in the 1960s, oops, okay, 1960s, which is a collection of 50 Burrita Singapura clips. So for example, you saw the earlier compilation of clips where um, Singapore joined the United Nations and that was in Hokkien. If you watch the version on me watch, there are actually English subtitles. And we also have Stories of Yesteryear, Diary of a Nation, which features um, 27 episodes of the Diary of a Nation series from 1988, which I talked about earlier. And lastly, our most recent series, Reflections of Yesteryear. It features speeches by Singapore's first generation leaders on the journey 
to survive and prosper as a nation. And now we have come to the end of my talk. Thank you for your patience during this really long talk. I hope you had fun watching the clips as much as I did finding them and that it inspires you to dig deeper into the treasures that we have in our archives.